Hi, it's a quick revision of, of Mice and Men, this time the setting of the bunkhouse. I'm going to start off with chapter two. If we take a look at uh, this description, the bunkhouse was a long rectangular building. Inside, the walls were whitewashed and the floor unpainted. Those two words, whitewashed walls and unpainted floors, are significant in terms of the impression of this being a really uniform, unadorned environment. It's almost institutional, it's really practical, it's almost like a prison. And we're going to come back to that idea, that image of the prison, during the course of this. In three walls there are small square windows, and in the fourth, a solid door with a wooden latch. Again, in terms of the kind of luxury that's afforded the people in the bunkhouse, it's very limited. Small windows, letting in very little light. And the solid door gives that sense of confinement, that sense of imprisonment. It's worth just bearing in mind in terms of that, the comparison with the waterhole in chapter one. Whereas we had lots of light, lots of colour in the waterhole, here, limited light and very limited colour. It goes on. Against the walls were eight bunks, five of them made up with blankets and the other three showing their burlap ticking. Uh, if you're not familiar with burlap, burlap's a really kind of coarse, rough fabric, um, the kind of sacking that you'd normally uh, find. So this is, again, very limited, and there's no luxury, it's all very practical. And most of the items that are found in this setting are from the ranch itself. You know, it doesn't seem as if there's much that's been imported for, luxur for luxurious purposes, it's all really practical. It's almost like found furniture. Over each bunk there was nailed an apple box, here's an example of that found furniture, with the opening forwards and made two shelves for the personal belongings of the occupant of the bunk. So it's very basic, it's very utilitarian, it's of the ranch, and very little luxury is afforded for the occupants. These shelves were loaded with little articles, soap and talcum powder, razors, and those western magazines ranch men love to read and scoff at and secretly believe. Notice that uh, the ranch men are generalised there, and it's this sense of generalisation and this kind of uniformity that I think is being stressed by Steinbeck. These people are all the same, and we really get a sense of that when you compare this general description of what happens with the articles that ranch men have to what happens when George starts to put his items into the apple box that's ascribed to him later on in the chapter. George seems satisfied. He unrolled his bindle and put things on the shelf. His razor. Earlier, we'd have the description there were razors there. So, so, comb, combs, bottle of pills is liniment, medicines. He's exactly the same as everybody else. There's that uniformity. He's not an individual, he's just one of many ranch men. In the middle of the room stood a big square table littered with playing cards, and around it were grouped boxes for the players to sit on. Um, again, the sense of littered suggests a lack of care, but this is the centre of the bunkhouse. It's the focus for everyone, that little bit of entertainment. It's rudimentary, but it's, it's their real focus. But then I think one of the most important parts of this description of setting. At about 10 o'clock in the morning, the sun threw a bright, dust-laden bar through one of the side windows. Now, I don't think you can juxtapose those two words, bar and windows, without getting a sense of imprisonment. You only normally think of barred windows within the context of a prison. And while it's actually describing the light coming through the window, a shaft of light, a bar of light, I think it's very difficult to avoid those kind of connotations of confinement and imprisonment. And in and out of the beam, flies shot like rushing stars. Uh, many people look at the rushing stars there, that simile, as being really positive. But I think we've got to recognise as well that it can suggest, I think, the chaos and the brevity of life. Flies are by their nature parasitic, they're associated with death. We've got to recognise that uh, within this, the confines of these few days on the ranch, we're going to be exposed to several deaths. You know, we've got you know, Candy's dog, we've got uh, Lenny himself, we've got um, the, um, the death of Curly's wife. But in contrast to chapter one, the flies are really interesting because they're so active. They're, they're rushing around. We have the passive creatures in chapter one's setting, ones where they, they seem to just be sitting and enjoying the pastoral idyll. Here, there's a sense of chaos, of panic. 
we've got to wonder whether this is kind of symbolic of ranch life, the association with death, the association with chaos, and uh, the kind of um, limited nature of life. It's all very transitory. The fly motif's repeated later in the chapter. The sun square was on the floor now, and the flies whipped through it like sparks. Again, sparks, that simile that uh, suggests the transitory nature of, of life. You know, sparks are here and then gone very quickly. Uh, but also it connotes danger as well, a spark can start a fire. Whipped again, that verb holds connotations of pain and punishment as well as the sense of speed that's being suggested by the activity of the fly. And finally, just nipping into chapter three, once again we get a um, description of the bunkhouse. Um, although there was an evening brighter showing through the windows of the bunkhouse, inside it was dusk. Um, there's this kind of ominous darkness inside the bunkhouse, despite the fact that it's still light outside. Could that be symbolic of a lack of hope? And with the context of that, it's worth uh, noticing that in chapter two, when Curly's wife appears, she blocks out the sunlight. She seems to take away hope as well. She's perceived as some kind of danger that um, the uh, ranch men have to overcome. As we go on, Slim and George came into the darkening bunkhouse together. Slim reached up over the car table and turned on the tin shaded electric light. Instantly, the table was brilliant with light and the cone of the shade threw its brightness straight downward, leaving the corners of the bunkhouse still in dusk. Notice that, you know, it threw its light straight downwards. Even the artificial light seems to be violent. Um, and it leaves these kind of pockets of darkness around the place. So there's still that sense of the ominous. Um, and it's also worth noting that just after that, George has to kind of retire from the light. It's too intense for him. He has to back away from it. So this isn't something that's dispelling darkness. It's also, it's almost something threatening in itself. Okay, thank you.